Hey there YouTube, Whiskey Cactus here, welcoming you back to our Heart of the Woods Let's Play. This is episode number 11, and last time some important shit happened in the world of Morgan and Evelyn and, uh, also Tara. Um, basically, uh, Evelyn took Morgan out into the woods and did some kind of ritual sacrifice thing. Morgan's not dead, but she did like a blood thing, cut her hand and put the blood on the tree, and the tree fucking burned. And, uh, it seems like a big deal. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and load up this file. And we are gonna keep on keeping on. So we are now in the per uh, POV of Maddie. So let's see where we go from here. So here goes. It's been a weird morning. Usually when I get up, Abigail's awake and ready to go. And usually she has been for several hours. This morning, though, I awoke to find her dozing nearby, long past when she'd normally be up. She complained about having a headache, so we decided to take a walk through the forest to clear her head. Do spirits get headaches? Seems odd. Hey there. So far it seems to have had the opposite effect, though, and we've been walking in uncomfortable silence. It's been maybe an hour or so when we first noticed the buzzing. Fairy wings. Oh boy. This is probably in reaction to the horrible shit that happened in the last episode. At first, it was very faint, like the sound of the wind or the rustling trees, but then it started getting louder and louder. Fairies. It's the first word she said in ages. She pulls me closer to her as the buzzing gets closer. Sure enough, the source of the noise soon comes into view. Dozens of fairies, maybe even as many as a hundred, flutter past overhead. They form a cloud rushing through the forest, nimbly weaving over and under the branches. When I first saw fairies back in the clearing, their movements were graceful and delicate, but now they're frenetic and urgent. The swarm travels right towards us, though they don't seem to notice or care about us at all. The buzzing has grown to an almost ear-splitting level, and I realize it comes from their wings. Like bees, their tiny wings beat rapidly to keep them up. They're a blur against the fairies' snowy-looking bodies. Suddenly, several of the fairies split off from the rest and dive towards us. Oh boy, I fling up my hands to protect myself, but they come to a halt overhead. Oh, hey, guys. This is my first chance to get a good, lu good luck at them. Oh, they are adorable. They're probably going to be very angry at us. <laughs> Their bodies are smooth and pale with a whitish tinge. Their eyes are beady and small, looking more like tiny flecks of obsidian than anything with sight. At first it looks like they're wearing gowns, but then I realize that what look like clothes are part of their body. Colorful plumage that helps each fairy keep make each fairy distinct from one another. Rather than legs, their bodies taper off into a point. Like little ballerinas. Like snowflakes. No two of them the same. No two look the same. One of them turns a somersault while the others hover anxiously. Our queen! Is that you? Have you returned? The voices are all identical, squeaky and raspy, yet impressively loud despite their tiny size. It takes a second for me to realize that they're addressing me. Um, excuse me, though? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm not your queen, I'm just an ordinary human. A human? Ordinary? Don't think so. They crowd in a little bit closer, their fingers grabbing the empty air as if to pick me up and carry me away. I take a step backwards with Abigail still holding tight to my arm. But the fairies just creep in. Their wings beat hummingbird fast, distractingly loud. Now, Abigail's never heard them talk, I don't think, because didn't she say she communicated with them, but they weren't speaking the same language or something? I promise I'm just a regular person. You're mistaken if you're thinking I'm your queen. A mistake? Have you seen her? We've been looking. Uh, we haven't seen her. We haven't seen anything like her. I have no idea what a fairy queen looks like, but I'm sure I haven't seen anything that fits the description. How long has she been missing? It's hard to say. Did you know? Time is a human concept. Their answers aren't helpful at all. They at least understood my question, which means they have some knowledge of time. Doesn't make a difference, though. The rest of their swarm has moved on, the buzzing fading once again, but they don't seem bothered. Uh, if we see her, I'll be sure to tell, you you're, tell her you're looking. That won't be needed. She surely knows. That's why she's our queen. Fairy's peculiar way of speaking in turn is almost comical. 
Since they haven't left us alone yet, I assume that they're still expecting or hoping for something. I'm a little afraid to find out what. Uh, do the three of you have names? We don't. We have no need. Names are for humans, too. They all nod in unison, given how everything else about them seems to be insect-like. I just assume that they have a hive mind of sorts. It would fit with everything else I know about the forest. I'm getting a bit tired of all the different networks and connections. It's silly, but it feels a little like not knowing the password to a friend's Wi-Fi. To help keep them straight in my mind, I give each of them a name. The one with the purple flower is Hay, Anon has the blonde hair, and the last one is Frio. Beside me, Abigail tugs at my sleeve surreptitiously. She's angled away from the conversation, trying to lead me out of it. I turn back to the fairies, putting on my best customer service voice. We have to go now. It was nice meeting you. I hope you're able to find your queen soon. Don't want to turn my back on them, so I wait for them to say their farewells and leave, but instead they come e in even closer, causing Abigail to gasp. Don't go. What if you stayed? You could be our queen. Oh, that feels like a trap. You would do. We could make it so. It would be easy. Oh, no, 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 no. Back away slowly. Alarm bells ringing in my head, I start to step backwards with Abigail keeping right on me. There isn't anyone else. Not everyone is suitable, but you are. Let us show you what it'd be like. We can give you a taste. Would that be all right? Their buzzing and flittering slows as three pairs of eyes stare at us. Abigail squeezes my arm. I move my mouth to say no, but the way their gaze pierces into me roots me to the spot. Like tiny dancers adorned with glitter, their skin shimmers in the low light, flittering through the clouds. Filtering through the clouds. Madison? Come on, let's go. But I can't. Or rather, I don't want to. Not yet. What if they know something useful, Abigail? We know lots of things. Secret things, clever things. We can know you too. They're pests. <laughs> their buzzing is a little too loud. Their voice is a little too shrill, but... You don't belong here, we can tell. But wouldn't you like to belong? No. <laughs> oh, look at them. They <laughs> creep a little bit closer in a synchronized motion. Close enough now that I could reach out and grab one if I wanted to, or slap them away. I don't, though. A place to belong. Could they really offer that? Uh-oh. This isn't good. What exactly do you mean? I can feel Abigail's grip tighten around my coat, but she doesn't say anything. Sensing an opening, the fairies circle dizzyingly around our heads. The forest doesn't reject you, but it doesn't accept you either. We could change that, though. Whatever it is you want, whatever you're searching for, if you help us, wouldn't you like that? Oh god, they're so creepy. With a jolt, I turn to face Abigail. I'm sure she knows what I'm thinking. Whatever I want, there's only one thing. Oh no, no, don't sign any contracts. Freedom. Abigail stares back at me for a moment, then presses herself against me. Looking up at the fairies, I nod. Oh, this is bad. Okay, just a taste. Excited, they dive downwards until they're level with my face. Abigail cringes, but doesn't let go. As one, the fairies close in, placing their hands on my face like they're checking my temperature. Okay, so I'm gonna save again. Go and do a little save. We're gonna go all the way back to one. And save here. I don't like this. I feel scared. Their hands are frigid, painfully so. It's amplified by the fact that I haven't felt cold in days. My hands jerk upward out of instinct, ready to pry them away, but I don't. Then one of the fairies moves their hands to cover my lips. One covers my ears, and the other covers my eyes. Uh-oh. For a split second, I feel like I'm falling through the air. Then it all hits me. All I see is black. I'm alone, and yet... Hundreds of presences flood my consciousness all at once. I can tell they're the fairies, but I don't know how I can tell. I'm bombarded by their awareness like tiny darts. Not using words or thoughts or intentions, but just feeling. They're somehow distant, as if behind a wall, but so, so present. I try to find the semi-familiar faces of Hay, Frio, and Anon, but they're indistinguishable from the rest. There's no individuality, no sense of identity at all. There's just the fairies as a whole. But I can feel what they're feeling. Panic and anger and hurt all churned together. The feeling of being lost. 
of not knowing where to go or what to do, but not being able to do, but not being able to sit still. Though I can't tie it to any particular memory or event, the feeling hits me so strongly, so undiluted that I think I might cry. I can feel that they've been scar scared by something, but I don't know what that something is. Then at last I feel a nudge within my mind. The sensation of being noticed. The presence takes me in, welcoming me. It occurs to me that I no longer exist. I try to ask what's going on, but I don't need to. The moment the question forms, the presence with me, the presence with me starts to answer. Images play in my head, ones I've never seen before. They're grainy, like an old film. If I try to focus on a particular detail, the whole thing becomes muddy. I can see flames burning away at the forest. The fire is so real that I can almost feel its warmth. When I start to focus on it, it that too vanishes. The presence of the fairies weighs on my mind, an uninvited audience to the next part. I can see a fairy stumbling alone, but something's wrong with it. I realize instantly I can't feel its presence. Where it should be, there's just a gaping hole so vast and profound that it hurts by sheer exclusion. It's agonizing. I want to tear my heart out of my chest so I don't have to feel it anymore. The presence of the fairies, the whole nest, tries to reach it, if, tries to reach after it and to fill the hole, but it won't allow itself to be touched. The moonlight overhead, which I crave, falls onto the lone fairy who hastens to accept it. The lone fairy flees, and the rest of them, the rest of us, mourn. One word pulses <coughs> through my head, both a condemnation and a reassurance. One word, though I don't know what, what it means. Moonsick. Moonsick. Moonsick, 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 moonsick. Oh boy. The vision twists and I can see a woman. But she isn't a woman. She's also a fairy. But not just. I'm so happy and relieved to see her that I just know she's the fairy queen. I can feel how much she misses the lone fairy. I know because I miss her too, desperately. I can see her searching. Her hope never fading until one day she's gone. The loss is even greater this time. A sick mixture of guilt and shame plagues me because I don't know where she is. Don't even know how long she's been missing. How could I not? How could I have not noticed? I wonder if that's Evelyn. The loneliness is so great that I want to do anything to erase it. Another silhouette flickers, just out of sight, but I can't keep track of it. We all have to watch it together, and then I realize it's me. But just like the fairy queen I saw before, it's also not me. Visions of time pass, months, years, centuries, and throughout them, all the loneliness is gone. It all feels right. I could fix this. The fairies remove their hands from me and I burst back into the real world with a mighty gasp for air. Madison, are you alright? Fairies dart back up, away from the furious glare that Abigail gives them. She's so angry. All I can feel now is her hand clutching me and I put my arm on her shoulder for support. My head spins and for a second I think I might fall over. The dizzy spell passes soon. Once I'm confident I'm not going to collapse, I nod. I'm fine. How long was I out? Abigail's face flickers into a look of confusion. She presses her hand to my forehead. Out? I didn't think they'd even begun. What? I watch the fairies, struggling to comprehend how so much could have happened in an instant like that. There's no way. We told you, didn't we? We aren't bound by time. Join us and you won't be either. Now that you've seen, and now that you've felt, will you join us? Oh god, are we gonna have a choice? Eyes wide, Abigail looks up at me. She doesn't have to say anything for me to know she's begging me to decline. I wish I could have felt how warm it was, how nice it was to belong like that. I wish she, sh she could have felt. Yet at the same time, it feels like a distant dream now, something detached and fading. I try to remember the sensation, but I can't. It's water slipping through my fingers. It seemed so real, but it wasn't. It was only a second. I can't sign my life away to the fairies for one second of visions, no matter how right it felt, no matter how comfortable. I'm sure that I was just seeing what they wanted me to see. I smile at Abigail and then shake my head, rejecting the fairies. I'm sorry, but I can't. Thank you for showing me what it would be like, though. How can we persuade you? We need our queen soon. You could be our only hope. I know you do, but I'm sorry, that just can't be me. We hope you'll change your mind. We'll be waiting for you. 
We'll be waiting for a queen. Bye, fairies. Well, that was creepy. With that, they turn tail and dart off in the same direction that their swarm had gone. Soon all trace of them is gone, like they'd never even been there. Madison, are you sure you're alright? Yeah, I'm sure. It was just a lot. Was that really that fast? Yes, they touched your face and then a moment later you gasped. That's insane. It felt like a long time, like years had passed. Abigail looks troubled, staring off into the forest where the fairies disappeared. Fairy magic is strange and beyond me. They're similar to the forest spirit, and yet... Different, but in a way you can't put into words? That's right. You certainly did see a lot, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Have you ever met their queen? Or seen what she looks like? Just once, long ago, she and the forest spirit are both guardians of the forest. Did you see her in your vision? I think back to what I saw as best as I can remember. The image shifts and shakes in my head, not wanting to be called to mind. More than what she looked like, I just remember how I felt, so happy and relieved to see her. I did, but I didn't get a clear look at her. I knew who she was, but I don't know if I'd recognize her if I passed her on the street. Do you think you could mistake me for her like they did? Absolutely not. You're much prettier than she is. Oh my god, she's so thirsty. Abigail <laughs> says it very matter-of-factly, as if she didn't just give me an enormous compliment. And she carries on like it, too. Be still my beating heart. But to the fairies, I expect it's hard for them to tell the difference between humans, so maybe you looked like her to them. I wonder how long the queen's been gone. Seems like they'd been coping just fine without her until something happened to scare them. Well, yeah. <laughs> Something like what? The fucking fire? Something hot and bright, something burning, something that hurt to think about. I don't know. I think it had to do with fire, maybe. So much of what I saw felt real, but most of it wasn't. Fire, hmm. Worry creases her face. What's wrong? Did you remember something? No, it was just a thought. Rather than elaborate, she fidgets with her hands. I don't push the subject. Maybe that's enough fresh air for today. We can head back to the church. All right. I'm pretty sure I detect a hint of relief in her voice. For the first time, I lead the way home. At least, I, I hope it's the way. <laughs> I'm reasonably confident. At my side, Abigail remains quiet and lost in her thoughts. With one hand, she clings limply to my sleeve, trusting my navigation. I don't disturb her, instead concentrating on remembering the path. It's to challenge myself. I'm sure that if necessary, Abigail would be able to leave, lead us home from anywhere. Still, I'm beginning to fear that I've led us astray when the grim walls of the church start to come into view. A mixture of relief and pride flows through me. It's also a little bittersweet. I've come to think of the church as home, even though I never felt that way about the cabin. Despite the fact that the concept of home is just a formality now. Surrounding ourselves with walls and a roof doesn't change a whole lot. Clouds are beginning to settle overhead, muting the daylight and making everything murky. Feels fitting for the mood. Abigail speeds up a bit as we reach the doors, and she's the first one inside. She sits down on one of the benches, fatigued. Mind if I join you? I bet she doesn't mind. I gesture at the open spot beside her. Please do. Oh. Wordlessly, she rests her head against my shoulder. Headache still? No, just horny. She nods. I'm afraid so. Our encounter there sure didn't help. I'm sure. It gave me a head me a headache of sorts too. More of a notion that I can't get out of my head. Fairy's outstanding offer sits with me. As hard as I try, I can't fully push the idea away. If there isn't any other way out of this, then maybe being a fairy queen would be preferable to just being a normal ghost. As long as I could still have Abigail with me. That's a last resort, though, because for as long as I can, I have to hold out hope that things can just go back to normal. The tower and I can leave Eisenfeld the same way we arrived, and that we can take Abigail with us. Beside me, Abigail shifts her head just a little. I'm sorry, am I bothering you like this? Absolutely the fuck not. <laughs> not at all. I wonder if she's close enough to hear my heart beating. They gonna kiss? 
Maybe I maybe it can't always be like this, but just for now it's all right. Though it's been a couple of days since we met the fairies and they made their offer, I haven't been able to get it out of my head. The visions themselves are just slush by now, with the memories of them having eroded into non-existence. But the feelings remain. The feeling of belonging and of freedom. There's something else I can't get out of my head, though. And she's sitting right beside me. Oh, oh, Abigail. Madison, here they come. Sure enough, a mother deer and her fawn come traipsing out of the bushes, no doubt on their way to get a drink. Starlight and the waxing moon make them look like ghosts at first, barely visible in the dusk. Upon entering the clearing, they see us, and both freeze. Abigail smiles encouragingly, reaching out a hand toward them. As a, after a moment's hesitation, the fawn takes one tentative step towards us, then another, and another. This one's name is Alma. Hello, Alma. I greet it the same way I would greet my friend's dog or cat. Deciding we're not a threat, the mother deer goes to the pond, while the baby one creeps even closer. Abigail never moves toward it, never pushing too far. Then it nuzzles her hand, leaning into the soft scratching motion of her fingers. Is this the deer that was watching you sing the other day? Most likely. Alma's a little bit shy, and sometimes prefers to keep her space. You know this deer- <coughs> you know this deer pretty well, huh? Of course, we're very good friends. To demonstrate, she strokes Alma's tawny neck. She doesn't even have to sit up to do so, since the fawn's face is just about level with her shoulders from where she's sitting on the ground. Alma closes her eyes, clearly enjoying the attention. Would you like to pet her? I'm certain she'd let you. Uh, sure. I lean forward, my hand outstretched like Abigail's was. But the second I move, Alma's eyes go wide and she bounds away into the darkness. Womp womp. Her mother watches alarmed from the shoreline. Guess not. Alma, come back. I promise Madison won't hurt you. She's just as sweet as you are. Aww. I'm glad for the darkness and that she can't see me blush. While she's not looking, I scoot a little bit closer to Abigail. Just a bit. It's gonna happen, guys. It's gonna happen. The hanging fairy baubles help to illuminate the young deer who watches from a safe distance. None of the fairies themselves seem to be around, though. This music is fucking beautiful. It takes a bit, with Abigail and I both sitting silently, but the fawn chooses to come back after all. Her steps are a little reluctant and ready to dart away at any second. She lets Abigail pet her, but watches me warily while it happens. I don't mind. I'm content to just watch and enjoy seeing how happy it makes them both. How long have you known Alma? Must have been a while for her to trust you like this. Oh yes, I've known her for her whole life. I've known her mother since she was a small too. Abigail waves at the mother deer by the pond who's returned to sating her thirst. That's amazing. I can only imagine the patience, time, and dedication it must have taken to earn the trust of the woodland creatures. Still, all things considered, I'm not surprised that they'd make an exception for someone like Abigail. Aww. She exudes comfort. I'm not sure how else to describe it, and I've never... Certainly never felt anything like it before. Maybe being close to her is just as comforting for the deer as it is for me. Do you have any other animal friends that I'll get to meet? Oh, certainly, if you'd like. I'm sure Mr. Bear is asleep for the season, but perhaps once he wakes up. There are also a pack of wolves around, but for Alma's sake, that would be best left to another time. The deer nuzzles her hand in agreement, and Abigail coos contentedly at it. Not so friendly as Alma and the rest of the deer, though. When I was a child, I wanted to have a deer for a pet. I thought perhaps I could learn to ride one like a horse. My sister and I would look for footprints in the snow and track them for as long as we could. She looks up at me, smiling despite the melancholy tone her voice has taken on. We never got very far, of course. Hardly a few feet into the forest. But to children like us, it was quite an adventure. You must miss her a lot. Abigail hardly ever mentions her family. I imagine that despite how long it's been, their memories must still be painful. She smiles thinly. In a sense. The deer is still luxuriating under her caress. The hand moves rhythmically and gently, alternating between petting and scratching Alma's neck. She relaxes a little, resting against my side but continuing to pet the deer. More than anything, I think I miss the days of wonder and awe, back when the forest and all of its creatures were still a mystery. Sometimes I wish it could be like that again, that it could be unknown. 
You wish you hadn't met them? No, not at all. At least not given the circumstances. I'm quite grateful for the companionship they've given me. For so many years, they've been one of the few sources of company that I've had. But while my love for them has never diminished, I've come to the conclusion that it's grown to the most it can ever grow as well. That's simply what the world had become for me. A small world of knowns and nothing more. And then you came. She looks away from the deer and back at me. A few tears spot her face, but she doesn't look sad. In fact, she's beaming. Oh god, it's gonna happen! And then I met you, Madison. Moonlight frames her face. The lovely night sky, the fairy tale friendly deer, the ethereal woman. It's an image straight out of a painting. You were my first unknown in countless years. The first soul I could speak with that I didn't yet understand. And what a wonderful unknown you turned out to be. Oh my god, it's so precious. I'm frozen again. I've never had anyone say anything that sweet to me. How am I supposed to respond to something like that? I try to calm my heart as it hammers in my chest. Looking at her soft expression only serves to accelerate its rhythm. I, uh, um, <clears throat> um. Th thank you. That's really, really sweet. I think you're wonderful, too. Her free hand darts out to grab mine before I have a chance to react as her eyes widen even more, nearly startling the deer away. Do you really mean that, Madison? I really do. You're an incredible person. Can't imagine having to go through what you've been through without losing any sort of capacity for joy, but here you are, still so full of energy and positivity. I hope that... Uh, I hope that I can maintain that sort of optimism. Oh my god, they're so fucking adorable. Abigail lets go of the deer and flings her arms around me in a tight hug. It's a pretty awkward position because of how we're sitting together, but I don't mind. I hug her back as best I can, my only anchor in the storm of chaos that my life has become. Indignant, Alma slicks her ears back and darts off toward the trees again. Sorry! Without letting me go, Abigail cranes her neck to watch, this time not calling the deer back. Alma's mother bounds over to join her daughter, and they both go careening off. I lean my head down to rest against Abigail's in what's become a familiar position. When did we get so comfortable with each other? Being like this just feels natural. Oh boy. She parts from me after a moment, sitting up straight again. She tilts her head up to look at the stars, and I gaze with her. The night is mostly clear, except for a few wispy clouds. All is still and quiet and calm. Even the pains of the forest don't seem to reach us here. I wouldn't call myself an optimist. I blink, surprised by her sudden words. I don't, nor have I ever really had much hope. There are small comforts and delights, but those aren't the same things as hope. I can remember names and faces, and even dreams and aspirations that I once had. Do you know what the most curious part of it is? She glances at me, and I notice tears in her eyes. Without thinking, I reach up and brush them away. No reaction. My heart pounds in my chest, nervous about something that I can't identify. Or that maybe I'm unwilling to accept. Afraid to be wrong about. What is it? I can't remember how it felt for those dreams to be within reach. Even with my meager, lonely existence, there was still a chance. As unlikely as it would have been, there was always the possibility that someday something would change. Something might happen. There was a light, so to speak, to look forward to. And the day that I died, that light went out. More tears, replacing the ones that I wiped away, sparkle in her eyes. I move to repeat the motion from before, but this time she stops my hands, holding them in her own between us. I never gave thought to what this unlife might be keeping me from. Not from the life I left behind, but whatever it is that I would have been met with had I lived to the end of my days. For a long time, I considered myself lucky that I was free from hurt and pain and worry and loss. Even if they were predictable and boring, my years here in the forest haven't been unpleasant. But I've never been optimistic. I've never had anything to look forward to. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine meeting someone as perfect as you. Never did I imagine that I would be happy again. Oh my god, just fucking kiss already. <laughs> I understand. I know what she's saying, and more importantly, what she means. A shiver runs down my spine. But Madison, I don't deserve this happiness. Not at the cost of your own. 
I keep thinking how if I'd been a bit faster or more decisive, perhaps I could have saved you that day in the snow. And that even if not, I don't know what future I've stolen from you. I don't know what awaits those of us who pass on. All I know is this unlife and its permanence and the way that you deserved better. She's crying now fully. Her chest heaves into a sob and I pull her closer to me in as t pull her closer to me in as tight a hug as I can manage. As kindly and delicately as I can, as gently as she always treats me, I hold her and sway gently, as much of our as much as our position will allow. I can tell just from the way she cries that she's been holding this in for a long, long time. I let her let it all out. It must have hurt so bad to be feeling that way. I speak in a whisper. Oh, they're so close. It's not your fault at all. Don't ever blame yourself for any of this. I know I don't. Ever since we met the day in the forest clearing, all you've done is made things better for me. I don't know if I ever told you this, but during those first days after we met, seeing you again was all that I would look forward to. I'd go to bed thinking about you and wake up the next morning thinking about you. And as for everything else, to be honest, I, I don't know how to feel about a lot of it. So much of it is just hard to process. I thought that I would I thought that it would get easier with time, but it hasn't. But there is one thing I know. One thing that I'm absolutely sure of. I squeeze her hands and I see her startle just a bit. Ah! No matter what I'm missing out on, I'm sure I'd rather be here with you. Oh my god, I'm gonna die. I mean it, every word of it. Never really put too much thought into an afterlife or anything like that, but any time spent here with Abigail is time well spent. If that means eternity, then, well, so be it. Just don't ever get tired of each other. <laughs> Beside me, Abigail gazes into my eyes wondrously. Her lips move as she searches for the words she wants to say. Madison. She shifts so that the starlight caresses her face, perfect and yet not nearly as luminous as she is. May I kiss you? Fuck yes, do it! For once in my life, I don't overthink it. Yes. Her eyelids flutter and close. Her breathing trembles, then steadies. I empty my head of any other thoughts. There it is! I press my lips to hers. So soft and so warm, as delicate as the fresh fallen snow, as sweet as cotton candy. Her form shivers against me and I place an arm around her for support and for comfort. Mutually. I can feel her getting more confident and more relaxed as 200 years of loneliness are melted away by one, one by one, and we're left just as two souls sharing a first kiss under the night sky. It feels so right. That after we've both been through so much sadness and loss, that we're now able to share this moment of joy. Not just share it, but be able to offer it to each other. It's our light at the end of the tunnel. Oh my god. When we finally part, my lips still feel electrified. She regards me with a coy expression, but a happy one. That was even more wonderful than the many times I had imagined it. Oh! I hope it was worth the wait. I'd wait another 200 years if it was the only way I'd get to kiss you again. Well, it's not. I promise you won't have to. To prove it, I lean forward and give her another quick peck on the lips. Well, aren't they just fucking precious? Abigail leans against my side yet again. We've done this several times before, but it's never felt like this. It's never felt this right. Everything feels a little brighter now. Well, isn't that just so fucking... God damn. Our next day passes blissfully. We wander the forest, seeing all our favorite spots. The comfort of our new relationship makes the time we spend together even more joyful. Everything is prettier when I'm seeing it with Abigail beside me. Of course, as has become our tradition, we end up back at the mystical fairy grove. We settle into our favorite spots by the shore with the perfect view of the pond. As much as I love films, I've never been a big fan of romant romantic scenes. They always feel so forced, the soaring music, the obvious atmosphere, the cheesy dialogue. They're so divorced from real life that I just can't take them seriously. But here I am, watching the sunlight reflect off the shimmering water of the lake as the woman I love leans against me. And I think that maybe those scenes weren't so unrealistic after all. Madison. 
What is it, sweetheart? Sweetheart. <laughs> I don't use pet names. It's not like me at all. With her, I feel like it fits. I know that I've said this before, and will probably say it many times in the future, but today and yesterday have been some of the happiest days of my life. Mine too. And it's okay, I'll never get tired of hearing you say that. She smiles at me as soft as that- Oh, something is gonna go horribly wrong, of course. Of course we can't have this much happiness. Just, uh, this music, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> she smiles at me as soft as ever. But hidden in her expression and in her tone of voice, I can detect a tinge of sadness. I touch her face, running my thumb across her cheek. She closes her eyes and leans into the motion. Are you feeling okay? Of course, why wouldn't I be? Don't fucking lie. I don't know, you just looked a bit sad. Maybe it was my imagination. I half expect her deni to deny it, but instead she nods. You do know how to read me, don't you? Yeah, I do. What's wrong? You can tell me anything, I promise. Only if you want to talk about it, of course. She pushes closer to me in response, resting her head against my chest. This day is so lovely, I don't want to say anything that could spoil it. You don't have to worry about that, Abigail. I love you, and that means I want to be there for you no matter what. We're gonna have plenty of wonderful evenings, I promise, and being open with each other is the best way to make sure they stay wonderful. This is unlike me too. Usually on the first day of a relationship, I'm still a bumbling bag of nerves. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I move too fast or too slow? But it's different with Abigail. That fear isn't there. Can't quite explain why, I just feel like I don't have to worry with her. I was thinking about other happy days that I've had, how long it's been since then, and how the memories have since soured. How much have I told you about my sister? N not much. You mentioned that the two of you were close and that you spent a lot of time in the woods together, but that's it. We weren't just close. Helena and I were inseparable. Whenever anything went wrong, she would always be there to protect me. She swore that that would never change. But fate had other plans for the two of us. She trails off. Every other time she's mentioned her sister, it's only in passing. Her story last night about tracking deer is the only solid detail I have about her. At first I expect her to stay quiet like before, but instead she keeps talking. Alright, this seems important. For as long as it's existed, Eisenfeld has had a... a curse, as you could call it. A terrible monster who would destroy the village if given the chance. Uh-huh. To appease its terrible rage, we would offer a sacrifice to it. Every generation, a new offering would be chosen, but it didn't just want flesh. The head priest would take the sacrifice into the forest to be offered to the horrible spirit. That sacrifice's soul and the head priest's body would both be consumed. Then, the new head priest would emerge, having taken the form of the poor sacrificed victim. It was a painful reminder of those we had lost. When I found that it would be a member of my family who was... <laughs> that it wouldn't be my beloved Helena who was harmed. Her voice wavers before she falls silent. Before I can tell her that she's said enough, she speaks again. Each word shakes as it leaves her mouth. Couldn't forget the joyous days of our childhood. Couldn't let such a kind soul suffer such a horrible fate. So when the time came, I offered myself. I volunteered to die so that Helena could live. And in that very moment, where our fates were sealed, I looked at them, at Helena. And do you know what I saw? Captivated by her tragic story, I can't even answer. I don't move my head or my lips. Relief. Not once did she try to stop me or change my mind. Not that I would have let her, but I don't think she even thanked me. My parents cried, of course, but they didn't argue either. None of them stepped forward to take my place. No one did. While I'm sure my sacrifice was appreciated, I was quickly discarded without even a token effort of gesture or gesture of appreciation. My sister, who had sworn to always protect me, had no difficulty accepting the fact that I would die for her. What, she just gave you away, just like that? If death looms over you for long enough, it corrupts everything, even love. 
it didn't corrupt you. Perhaps. Though I believe that's why I'm still here today. What do you mean? The first step of the ritual involved separating the sacrifice's body from its soul. Oh boy. From what she told me is she... did it. Those poor victims usually try to resist, begging for someone else to be taken, and when their souls are ripped away, they're too damaged to carry on. But I didn't resist. I went peacefully, and so the gentle forest spirit, who I'd been raised to believe was some kind of demon, eventually came and took me away, and I've been here ever since. Her words carry a sense of finality. Not knowing what else to do, and still stunned by her story, I simply lean closer to her and pull her into an embrace. There aren't any words that could be enough. Physical comfort is all I can offer. To my surprise, though, when she finally pulls away from me, she looks happier than before. Just like I did earlier, she touches my cheek gently, and then leans in for a kiss. Thank you for listening. I've told the one person who matters, and now I think I can heal. I know, sweetheart. I love you more than anything. I love you too, more than anything. Oh my god. Let's just inject that saccharin into my veins. She sighs contentedly and leans against my shoulder. She takes my hand twines her fingers with mine. We sit there for a long time. We don't say anything. We don't even move. All we do is watch the sky and feel each other's heartbeats. Back at the church, where we're gonna bang, I wake up with a headache, and I know that something's wrong. I'm alone. Abigail must have disentangled herself from my arms at some point, leaving me on my own. Get up and pace around the church, not seeing her. After a bit, I find her outside its doors. Good morning. Good morning, my love. Her lips smile, but her eyes don't. It's a look I'm pretty familiar with by now. I slip an arm around her as I take my spot by her side. Sleep okay? Well enough, I'm sure all of my nights will be better now that they're spent beside you. Can't help it, I kiss her on the cheek, and true joy brightens her face. How about you? <clears throat> Pretty good, I woke up with, like, a bad feeling, though. A bad feeling about what? I'm not sure, my head kind of hurts, so maybe that's it. Actually, now that I think about it, it's the first actual pain I've felt since turning. It's not the worst headache I've ever had, not by far, but it's enough to be annoying. It feels the same as being dehydrated or having a slight cold. Aw, poor dear. She stands on her tiptoes to kiss my forehead. Yeah, I felt the same, actually. I hoped that stepping outside might help, but it seems not. She rubs her temples, and I notice just how ragged her eyes look. How long have you been out here? A while, perhaps an hour or so. I was afraid I'd wake you. Nah, I slept right through. It's not just a coincidence that we both feel sick, is it? Abigail purses her lips. Her brief silence is enough confirmation. No, I doubt it is. It must be something to do with the forest. The trees before us sway in the breeze. To me, they look the same as ever. No traces of lingering sickness or pain. You felt bad the other day, too, when we first met the fairies. Was it the same thing then? Most likely. Changes in the air. Something's happening, and it isn't good. Think of the fairies fleeing some unseen terror. Is it... Evelyn? I half expect her to shake her head. I want her to say no, but she nods. I think so. I don't know what she's done or why, but this can't all be coincidence. I nod, my thoughts turning to Tara and Morgan. I wish they would just get out of here. To leave me to my fate and escape, let Evelyn do whatever it is she's doing while they're across the ocean, safe. I know that won't happen, though. Tara's not the type to back down from a fight. Except this time, I know she's hugely outmatched, even with Morgan's help. What about the forest spirit? You said it's a guardian of the woods, right? Why doesn't it stop her? I'm sure it's doing what it can, but it's just as intimately connected to the forest as the fairies are. Far more than you or I, so as the forest itself weakens, so does it. Worry creases her brow. Is there any way we can help? Not that I know of. I can tell she's not really happy with that answer. Maybe we can think of something together. There has to be something we can do. Yes, perhaps. She looks up at me adoringly. Maybe we can bang. I feel like I can accomplish anything with you by my side. Her loving words are nearly enough to counteract the worry that I feel. 
You've already beaten death. There's no way Evelyn can stop us, at least not a second time. First, we just have to figure out how. Abigail slips her hand into mine where it fits comfortably. Perhaps you'll make an optimist out of me yet, Madison. Shall we go for our walk? Absolutely. I'm glad that our changing relationship hasn't changed our routine. The walks around the forest keep me grounded. They're enjoyable, but also a solemn reminder of how trapped we are here. My dream of finding a way out hasn't disappeared or diminished at all, it's just evolved to include Abigail, too. There's no way I'm leaving these woods without her. We chat idly as we stroll, enjoying the newfound comfort and intimacy that comes from being lovers, rather than just friends. The pain in my head is still here, still there, and I'm sure Abigail still suffers from hers as well, but it's easy enough to ignore in lieu of the pleasure that simply being together brings. We've reached the edge of the fairy clearing where we always seem to end up. Abigail is glued to my side. I wouldn't have it any other way. Alright. I think, though, we're getting a little late into the episode, so I'm gonna go ahead and save here. I was kind of hoping that would be the end of it. But at this point, we're just going to go ahead and save and end off the episode here. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please be sure to leave a like and a comment down below. And make sure you're subscribed for more Heart of the Woods. Next time, we're going to continue on this path and uh, see what happens. The thing happened. Abigail and Maddie are now together, which is pretty great. Tara and Morgan are together, which is pretty great. But now we've got to figure out what the fuck to do about Evelyn. And hopefully we will strategize a little bit more and see, you know, if there's an actual plan or if we're just going to wing it. Who knows? But uh, I have a feeling that things are going to start heating up pretty soon in more ways than one. So I hope you're excited for that. I know I am. I will see you in the next episode. Goodbye.